Well, I'm glad to have you all back for podcast number 31 in my series, Colonies to Colossus, The Rise of a Giant. In this episode, we're going to take a general look at the frontier wars that occurred between Queen Anne's War and King George's War, a period of roughly 30 years between 1711 and 1744. During this period of time, there were no wars between the European nations fought in North America. The frontier wars were fought between Europeans and Indians, and between Indians themselves. Both the Europeans and Indians jockeyed for advantageous trade and military alliances to enrich themselves and to gain advantages over traditional enemies. The frontier wars had important and lasting consequences. Several Indian nations were erased from the map or nearly annihilated, and the English colonies of South and North Carolina came very close to being destroyed, which would have really changed the course of American history. The frontier wars also helped to set the stage for the establishment of Georgia, England's last colony in North America. Spain played little part in the frontier wars. During Queen Anne's War, Indians allied with the English had decimated the Indian population of Spanish Florida, which left the Spanish too weak to really do much. As a result, France and Great Britain were the European nations involved in the frontier wars. Before going any further, I want to point out something that I think is really important to mention, and it has to do with the composition of the armies that fought in the frontier wars, because I think it tells us some things. On the screen right now is a diagram depicting Colonel John Barnwell's army. Barnwell was a colonel in the militia, South Carolina militia, and he led an army against the Tuscarora Indians during the Tuscarora War, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. Now take a look at the composition of his army. He's had about 700 men. About 40 of his army were South Carolina militiamen. These were mostly mounted troops, and they had a unit of dogs that they used in war. But the remainder of his army, about 660 men, were allied Indian warriors that were fighting alongside his militia against the Tuscarora Indians. Now, sometimes the ratios were a little different. There might be more militia in some armies, but in almost every case, this is the standard pattern. You have a core or nucleus of European colonial troops, and then the bulk of the forces are made up of allied Indian warriors. And this is pretty much the same throughout all the frontier wars, whether they involve the British or the French. So why did this happen? Why would European colonial armies mainly be composed of Indian allied warriors? Well, here's the reasons. The colonial authorities liked having Indians in their army because they didn't cost anything. They had their own weapons and they could live off the land. And since they were adept at forest fighting, and since almost all the frontier wars, almost all of it was composed of forest fighting, the Indians were a natural choice. But why would Indians fight alongside Europeans against other Indians? What was their motive for doing so? The Indians had primarily two motivations. The first one was revenge. These Indian nations often had bitter wars with each other. They had been having wars since long before Europeans showed up. And so this was a chance to even the score and do a little revenge. The other motivation had to do with self-enrichment. These wars often allowed the Indians to take plunder as well as slaves. At this time, both the French and the British relied heavily on Indian slaves for their plantations. Indian slavery was quite prominent. All right, on the screen right now is a map of North America, which shows you generally where the different frontier wars occurred. You can see the little explosion marks. The red ones were the wars between the English and Indians, the blue ones between the French and Indians, and the one green one out in the center of the continent was the one that the Spanish were involved in. After Queen Anne's War ended, the English got control of Nova Scotia, or they renamed it Nova Scotia. The French called it Acadia, and they also got Newfoundland. The French had been steadily pushing westward through the Great Lakes and into what is today Wisconsin, which triggered the Fox Wars. They also wanted to control the Mississippi, and they set up in the lower end of the Mississippi what was their most prosperous colony called Louisiana. It's important to note that all of the wars between the French and the Indians had to do with control of the Mississippi River. And part of that control included keeping the Indians along the Mississippi River free of English influence. The Spanish Empire at this time was in the process of slowly crumbling. There were some skirmishes between the French and Spanish in western Florida, and also the Spanish did send up a force called the Villasur Expedition in 1720 to try and assert their control over central North America from the French. There was a battle that occurred in what is today modern Nebraska. Other than this, the Spanish weren't too really involved in the frontier wars, so I won't be saying a whole lot about them. You'll notice on this map, I've left the dates a little bit fuzzy in some of these wars, especially the ones between the French and the Indians, because it's hard to really pin down exactly when they start or end. Sometimes there would be a couple of expeditions that might calm things down. There might be a defeat. 
but the skirmishing really kind of started before these dates and didn't really end up until the time the French lost control of North America to the English. To fully understand the causes of the frontier wars, we have to understand how trade between Europeans and Indians worked. I'll focus here on the English, because mainly these podcasts are about the English, but whatever I say about the English pretty much applies to the French too, because the dynamic was very similar. Generally speaking, within a generation of first contact between Indians and Europeans, the Indians became almost dependent on the Europeans because they couldn't manufacture the things they needed most, especially arms and ammunition. And Indian nations that didn't have firearms could be quick prey for their traditional enemy Indians that did have firearms. So it was imperative that they continue to get firearms. Plus they liked other things, cloth and liquor and other things like that. So right off the bat, there's a dynamic of dependency that factors in. The king saw the Indians for their strategic value. He wanted them to be trading partners and allies against other European nations and against other Indian hostile tribes. So the king was usually sending instructions to governors about dealing fairly with the Indians and getting along. At the local level, there was a lot of money to be made with Indian trade. At the local level, there was a lot of money to be made by trading with the Indians. So the colonies usually regulated or at least tempted to by licensing which people could trade with the Indians and who couldn't. The traders who traded with Indians often adopted Indian ways. Many of them married Indian wives. They adopted the Indian language. They could speak with the Indians on their own terms. They understood their culture. And so they were more than just commercial partners. They were also ambassadors between the colonies and the Indians themselves. But many of them were also pretty unscrupulous. They sold cheap or shoddy merchandise. And many Indians were in debt to these traders who in turn were in debt to others. And so debt collections could be kind of ruthless. There are stories of Indian women, euphemistically called trade girls, who engaged in prostitution to try and pay off some of these debts. And the Indian slave trade was a hot business. Sometimes traders would seize Indian family members and sell them into slavery to pay off some of these debts. Also, some of these unscrupulous traders might incite conflicts between Indian nations and their traditional allies because at the time, a captured Indian could be sold as a slave. And so having wars between these Indian nations greatly enriched some of these traders. Colonial officials were stuck in between the king's edicts that they should get along with the Indians and also between the traders who were bringing a lot of money. There was so much money to be made that it was hard to really regulate the trade properly, I think. And even though they sometimes did make goodwill efforts to try and stop corruption, it really didn't go as far as it needed to go because there was just so much money to be made in it. Because trading favored the colonists or the European colonists, they often had the upper hand and a trade embargo could be crippling to Indians. So this often meant that colonial authorities got their way when it came to dealing with Indians or having conflicts with them. And the Indian slave trade, which peaked in the 1720s, greatly complicated these relations and was a huge source of frustration to the Indians themselves. And lastly, there's the reality that when you have two such differing cultures coming in contact, there would naturally be misunderstandings, and there were. The Europeans, for their part, generally looked down on the Indians because of their primitive living conditions and their technology was somewhat backwards. One of the things that made the Indians feel unequal to the Europeans is that European males were allowed to marry Indian women, but Indian males weren't allowed to marry European women. So they never felt like they were on a par with the Europeans or that they could become one people. The screen right now is a map showing a close-up of where the frontier wars occurred. The Abenaki War occurred in New England, which I'll show that on a separate map because I think it needs to be treated separately. The red boxes represent English cities and forts, the green are Spanish, and the blue ones represent French towns and forts. The names of Indian tribes are in italics, and the large pale red explosions show where the various frontier wars occurred. Just below Canada, I show the where the Iroquois Confederation was. This was a confederation of five tribes. At the west end were the Seneca, and on the east end were the famous Mohawk. The Iroquois are important to note in this podcast. I did a separate podcast on the Iroquois, podcast number 24, and I strongly recommend you listen to that if you haven't. It does put a lot of these events in the frontier wars in perspective. The Iroquois were nominally allied with the English, but they often pursued their own interests. And it's interesting to me that they were involved in nearly all of these frontier wars that we're going to talk about. They kind of acted as power brokers. And it's amazing how far they could project their military strength, hundreds of miles from their homeland. They projected it as far south as Georgia and as far west as the Mississippi River. One of the problems with a map like this is it gives the false impression that these Indian locations were static. And that's not really true. The Indian tribes were shifting and moving and relocating. Sometimes they would migrate quite a bit of ways to get either a better hunting ground or to get away from an enemy, often displacing the Indians that were already there. So you have to keep that in mind as you're looking at this map. 
I'm going to start off by talking about the war between the English and the Tuscarora. I want to spend some time on this because so much that happened in here is very similar to what happens in all the other wars, regardless of who's involved, whether it's the French or the English, the dynamics are very similar. The Tuscarora were one of the most powerful tribes within the area, and many of the other Indians around them spoke Tuscarora language to get along with them. They were in a strategic location because they were right in the center of North Carolina, and in order to expand westward, the English would have to either move them or get permission from them or buy the land or something from them. So there's kind of like a cork in a bottle holding in English expansion westward. Some kind of conflict was inevitable. The Tuscarora were closely related to the Iroquois. In fact, they migrated from New York, which was the Iroquois heartland, into North Carolina several centuries before Europeans came on the scene. And so it's kind of interesting that when the Tuscarora complained about the English colonists encroaching on their land, you have to kind of ask, well, what Indians did the Tuscarora take the land away from when they migrated there centuries earlier? The Tuscarora pattern of life is pretty similar to many of the other Indians in the region, so it's worth t talking about here because it gives you an idea what the other Indians did. We know that they lived in villages, and the villages need a good deal of surrounding land to support them. And they grew these huge, immense cornfields. They also grew beans, pumpkins, and once watermelons were introduced by Europeans, they grew those too. The nearby forest provided things like hickory nuts, berries, wild parsnips, and turnips. And many Tuscarora women tended gardens. And in many cases, they supplemented their diets with fishing, especially if they were along the coast or right near a river. In the fall, the Tuscarora would leave their villages and occupy hunting quarters. And part of their hunting methods was they would burn areas of the forest because then meadows would grow there, which attracted the deer. The men hunted the deer, and then the women worked the skins into hides. And a lot of these hides got sold as part of the trade with Europeans. In fact, it was their main product that they sold to Europeans. Once the resources and soil of an area were depleted, Tuscarora Village would simply relocate to a new area for as long as it lasted there. So they're kind of semi-migratory, and some of these patterns of lifestyle irritated Europeans who felt that they were encroaching on their land that they had been granted. Or if you were a European that had been granted a lot of acres out in the backcountry and you went out there and found part of it had been burned, was using as a hunting ground, you would feel frustrated. And of course, the Tuscarora felt frustrated that this was their traditional hunting land, so you had no right to complain kind of thing. So you can see how this would create kind of tensions between the two. Each Tuscarora village was somewhat autonomous. It had its own chief and leaders. And this is very important to emphasize in all of these wars that, you'll, that we're going to talk about. Not all of the villages in an Indian nation would participate in the war. They, in fact, in the Tuscarora War, many of them did not. So we have to keep that in mind that the, the, the entire nation wasn't always involved in the war. It might just be a few villages led by hotheads that were angry and wanted to get revenge. I mentioned the abuses that went on in the trading relationship with the Indians in general, and certainly many of the Tuscarora were ripe for rebellion or they were angry at the English for the things they had suffered. The flashpoint came when a group of German and Swiss colonists were settled along the coast in central North Carolina in a place called New Bern. The English government had a policy of settling German and other peoples from Europe who were Protestants into their colonies because they felt it was a great strength to them. Some of the leaders of this colony were exploring up the rivers looking for new sites for settlements, and a Tuscarora band of Indians captured them and were angry and frightened that these people were looking to further encroach on their lands. Many of the Tuscarora were already at a boiling point, and they felt that the actions of these colonists had justified them to take action into their own hands, do a little retaliation to send a message to the English that they didn't want them coming on their lands and so forth. So on September 21, 1711, the Tuscarora came into the towns and villages as they normally did. Many of them worked as laborers to earn money, but they were really scouting out the places. And during that night, about 500 Tuscarora warriors gathered in forests as close as they could to the settlements, and at dawn, they swept in and started killing colonists. Many hundreds of them died. Many were captured. This kind of illustrates, too, the difference in the way Europeans and Indians went about their warfare. The Indians were much more subtle, often sneaky about the way they went about war, whereas the Europeans didn't. They relied on firepower and coming in and destroying an enemy. So it's kind of different that way. The way that the Tuscarora killed many of the colonists was kind of interesting and shows that they were angry. They wanted to not only get payback, but they also wanted to kind of insult the colonists. Many men had, after they were killed, had their wife's uh, clothing put on them. One had a nightcap, his wife's nightcap put on him. Another man, was his socks were turned down over his shoes. One African slave had his hand cut off after he was killed. One woman, after she was killed, was put in a praying position, leaning up against the chair. Many women had stakes run up through them, and women that were pregnant had the fetuses ripped out, and they were hang on trees. So this was definitely a payback-type situation. 
It's estimated that about 130 to about 140 colonists were killed and about 20 to 30 were taken captive. And this is a very important point in all of these wars on the frontier. The captives were important. Men were not that valuable as captives. The women and children were highly prized for both sides. The Indians wanted women and children because they could assimilate them into their tribe. The colonists wanted women and children because they could be sold as slaves. After a few days, the attacks slowed down. Many of the Tusker War were seen carrying heavy bags of loot, and many of them were drunken, too. They'd gotten into places and drank all the rum, so it kind of slowed down the attacks. One of the leaders of the Swiss and German colony or settlement that was being set up on the coast there blamed this whole thing on the Carolinians. He said that the rough treatment of the Indians by some, quote, turbulent Carolinians who cheated those Indians in trading and would not allow them to hunt near their plantations and under that pretense took away from them their game, arms, and ammunition. These poor Indians, insulted in many ways by a few rough Carolinians, more barbarous and inhumane than the savages themselves, could not stand such treatment any longer. In response to these surprise raids, one of the local sheriffs led a small band of militia, probably not more than 30 or 40 men, into a a nearby Tuscarora village. They killed many of the Tuscarora and caught one of the chiefs there and slowly roasted him alive near a fire in vengeance for what had been done to the colonists. But other than this, the North Carolinians were not really prepared for this kind of thing. North Carolina was a fairly weak colony. It was not heavily populated. And its government was in disarray as well. The governor had died. The new acting governor, reflecting upon the governor's death, made this comment that the governor's death had, quote, left us in a most deplorable condition, a barbarous enemy to deal with, a scarcity of provisions, being scarce able to supply our garrisons, and what small forces have out, and the worst all, a divided and ungovernable people. So was not only was North Carolina unprepared for this attack, but there were a lot of internal divisions and disarray. They had been on the near verge of civil war before these attacks occurred, and they also had a large population of Quakers who were pacifists and wouldn't take up arms. To finance whatever fighting they needed to do, the colonial officials decided that they would allow people to sell captive Indians as slaves, and that would help finance the cost of the war. Many of the colonists expressed terror at the thought of some of the Tuscarora tortures that could be inflicted. We talked about this how how Indians had ritualized tortures in my podcast about the Iroquois. Some of the tortures that they might face would be things like having lots of little splinters, wooden splinters stuck in their skin, and then having them lit on fire a few at a time and the excruciating pain that would cause. Or in another case, one person had their wrists cut all around and then the flesh was pulled off of their hands like a glove. Another thing that gave a lot of unrest to the colonists were the fact that there were ambassadors from the Iroquois, namely from the Seneca, stirring up the Tuscarora against the English. And of course, this opened the idea that possibly the French were behind that. The French were always trying to undermine the relationship between the Iroquois and the English. Had the Iroquois actively decided to go against the English, it could have been a really difficult situation. Because North Carolina was so ill-prepared for this kind of thing, they turned to neighboring Virginia for help. And Governor Spotswood was willing to send the Virginia militia down, but he demanded that the North Carolinians pay the expense of the militia, which the North Carolinians didn't have the money to do. Besides, officials in Virginia felt that the North Carolinians had brought this on themselves. Governor Spotswood made this comment about the North Carolinians. He said, there reigns such stupidity and dissent in the government of North Carolina that it can neither concert any measure nor perform any engagement for its own security. North Carolina also turned to its sister colony, South Carolina, which did respond. I think they knew that they could be involved in this too. And so they sent an army up under Colonel Barnwell, which we've talked about a little earlier. South Carolina was more prosperous, had more people than North Carolina, so they were in a better position to help. So Colonel Barnwell comes up through the kind of the back entrance to North Carolina from South Carolina with an army that's mostly made up of Indian allies. I talked about the composition of his army earlier in this podcast. Probably his most reliable troops were his Yamasee warriors, who themselves were interested in making money by capturing Tusker Wars that could be sold as slaves, as well as collecting loot. Barnwell focused at first on destroying Tusker War towns and food supplies. He ran into some problems, however, though, because the Tuscarora had a slave, runaway slave among them, that knew something about engineering, and he was able to help them build European-style forts, which cost Barnwell dearly during the fightings. They had no artillery to deal with these forts. Part of Barnwell's problem, too, was that once the Yamasee started looting and capturing slaves, they went back to South Carolina so they could, because their part in the war was done, they had no further interest in fighting the war, so his army was reduced greatly after just a few days. 
Many North Carolinians were angry also that watching their possessions and loot being taken back by the Indians, the Yamasee Indians, instead of having it returned to them. The forts that I mentioned earlier were particularly difficult, and whenever he got close to them, sometimes the Tuscarora would resort to torturing any captives, so Barnwell and his men would hear the, the cries of the tortured, and it was made them afraid to attack. Although he didn't seem to have a problem with his Yamasee warriors because sometimes they would roast and eat one of the Tuscaroras that they had captured. After some tough campaigning, Barnwell's army was eventually able to force the Tuscarora to come to terms. He never defeated them, but they themselves were being worn down. They agreed to a treaty, and Barnwell was happy to leave North Carolina. He never felt he got the support from the colonial officials there, and he was angry at them when he left. And the colonial officials there felt that Barnwell shouldn't have given up so easily. They wanted to really exterminate Tuscarora. Indians. They, they were bent on vengeance, not on getting along at this point. When the Tuscarora ambassadors and leaders showed up to negotiate the details of this treaty, they were slaughtered. Now, we don't know exactly who did the slaughtering, but it's usually thought that the colonial officials were probably behind it because they wanted the war to go on. They wanted to exterminate the Tuscarora. They were angry at what had happened. They were out for vengeance. This act reignited the war, and South Carolina sent up another army, this one under Colonel Moore, who was a little more effective commander, and he was a little bit more politically savvy than Barnwell had been. In the end, he was able to bring the Tuscarora to terms, and And the aftermath at the time was frightening. About 200 North Carolina colonists died, not to mention Allied Indians and South Carolina militia. About 2,000 Tuscarora were were sold as slaves. Many ended up in the West Indies. A large chunk of the Tuscarora migrated back to New York and became the sixth nation of the Iroquois Confederation. The remaining Tuscarora were put on a reservation, which kind of ironically saved them because now the English uh, colonists couldn't really encroach on that land. They had to kind of go around it. North Carolina it was greatly impoverished by the war because they had such a huge loss in property and uh, destruction of buildings and so forth. And they were left with innumerable lawsuits uh, pending about property and there were children that were orphaned that had to be given to other families. It was a horrible war, very destructive. We now turn our attention to the Yamasee War. And as you look at the map there, you can see that this war occurred the same year the Tuscarora ended. So, and now it was South Carolina's turn to deal with the war and it was now North Carolina's turn to help South Carolina. South Carolina had a lot of internal division, just like North Carolina did, and this led to a breakdown in communications with the Yamasee, who had been allied with the English up to this point. We saw how they helped during the Tuscarora War. Sensing the uneasiness, the South Carolina officials sent a diplomatic mission to talk to the Yamasee, who were slaughtered on April 14, 1715. And this triggered the fighting. The Yamasee had plenty of Indian allies. They weren't the only ones in this. They had all suffered the abuses from South Carolina, which was a bigger, more prosperous colony than North Carolina. It was really the slave, the most extensive slave-owning colony in the colonies. And it was ground central for the Indian slave trade as well. The attacks were so severe that many South Carolinian colonists had to flee to Charleston for safety, which was the biggest city in the South. North Carolina sent troops to help, and here's the supreme irony of the war. Many of the troops that came to help were Tuscaroras. The Tuscarora didn't necessarily like the English, but they wanted vengeance against the Yamasee, who had taken them as slaves and done things to them during the Tuscarora War. Carolina colonial officials actually passed legislation freeing the Tuscaroras who had been taken as slaves so that they could help. They also became so desperate that they passed laws allowing for the arming of African slaves, which they almost never did. They were afraid of slave uprisings. The situation was so desperate that the South Carolina officials reached out to the Cherokee for help. The Cherokee were a very powerful and large tribe in the region at that time. There were really two ways to influence Indians at this time. One was you could send an overwhelming army, which would frighten them into respecting you and wanting to help you, or you could send presents, which would influence them to want to like you a little bit more. And in this case, South Carolina did both. They sent an army under Colonel Moore to the Cherokee with gifts. And this seemed to do the trick. It persuaded the Cherokee that they should take up as allies with the South Carolinians. Having the Cherokee as allies was critical, but it was also expensive. One colonial official complained, We buy their friendship at too dear a rate. The demands they make are so unreasonable that we may properly say we are become their tributaries. So this was the problem. In order to keep the Cherokees as friends and allies, they had to keep sending them gifts, and it was getting quite expensive. The French, in retaliation, actually had their Illinois ally Indians attack the Cherokees. In order to help South Carolina, its sister colony, 
New York officials incited the Iroquois to send warriors down who started doing their own savage raids and terrorizing the Yamasee and their allies too. So you can really see how complicated this got. Many people involved over thousands of miles of distance. So it was the alliance with the Cherokee and the help of the Iroquois that saved South Carolina. Had that not happened, it's very possible that South Carolina would have been destroyed. And if that had happened, North Carolina might have been next, and colonial history would have been very different. In proportion to population, the Yamasee War was one of the most deadly in colonial American history. To escape, many of the Yamasee fled south where they were welcomed by the Spanish. And the Spanish used them and continued to arm them and encouraged them to do raids on South Carolina, which they did. South Carolinians took the situation so seriously that they actually had regular troops brought over from England to occupy Fort King George to act as a buffer and to try and protect them from the raids. And in 1728, the English mounted a full-scale invasion of Florida to try and deal with the Yamasee, which did calm them down, but it never really stopped their raiding against the English completely. The consequence of the Yamasee War was that it depopulated the area of hostile Indians and made it possible a few years later for Georgia to be founded, which was the last colony founded. On the screen right now is a map of New England and the war between the English and the Abenaki. The red boxes depict English cities and forts, the blue ones depict French cities and forts, and the red explosions give a general idea of where the fighting occurred. This war was very different than the Tuscarora or Yamasee Wars, and unlike the Carolinas, the New England colonists were not involved in the slave trade or any of the dynamic down there that caused the problems. The problem here had to do with territory and the vagueness of what was a region called Acadia. After Queen Anne's War, the French ceded Acadia to the English. The English assumed that it included the island that they called Nova Scotia, you can see it there on the map, as well as inland territories that today would include New Brunswick and Maine. The French insisted that Acadia only included the island of Nova Scotia. Now the Indians lived in the area of the mainland that the French said was still theirs, and as English colonists began settling in those areas from New England, it caused the Abenaki Indians, who were allied with the French, to react and start doing raids. And of course, this war was somewhat directed by the French. It was a proxy war in some ways, since the Abenaki were their allies. One of the interesting characters that was involved in this war was a guy named Father Sebastian Rail. He was a French Jesuit. I'm sure I'm not saying his name properly, but he was the one of the ones that lived among the Abenaki and was stirring them up against the English. Many of the English were moving back in and resettling some of the villages that had been abandoned during Queen Anne's War. If you listen to my previous podcast about King William's War and Queen Anne's War, you get some idea of how the fighting in this war went. It was pretty much identical. You had Abenaki raiding parties coming down, killing isolated farming uh, communities and raids, some of them into Massachusetts itself, which prompted Massachusetts authorities to build Fort Dummer to kind of protect the area. And it's a war of attrition. The colonial officials in New England were offering scalp bounties of 100 pounds per scalp. Finally did a major campaign against the major Abenaki village in what is today modern Maine, and that kind of stopped the war, put an end to it. So it was savage fighting, not many combatants involved and very similar to some of the previous wars we've seen in New England. And nothing really important was gained, just a lot of misery all around. On your screen now, we're returning back to the map of eastern United States, and we're going to talk about the first of the three wars between the French and the Indians. I don't plan on going in as much detail in these wars, but just kind of mentioning some of the high points or, or important points of them. And the first I want to talk about is the Natchez Revolt of 1725. The Natchez appear to be the remnant of an ancient culture. Uh, Just across the Mississippi River from St. Louis today in Illinois is a place called Cahokia, uh, where there are large flat-top pyramids resembling those of Mexico, but these are made of earth, not stone. And the Natchez may have been the last remnant of the culture that built these structures. Now, initially, relations between the Natchez and the French were generally friendly, but there were intermittent clashes between the two leading up to the Natchez Revolt of 1729, and as a result, the French had built Fort Rosalie, which you can see on the map there. What led to the revolt was the heavy-handed and unfair practices of the French governor, and that's what sparked the rebellion. Specifically, he had demanded that the Natchez vacate areas where he wanted to build plantations for himself. So this, along with other insults, sparked the Natchez to revolt. The fighting started when the Natchez and some of their allied Indians 
snuck into Fort Rosalie in disguise and bringing gifts. And then once they were inside the fort, they killed all the French in the fort and burned all of the nearby farms and settlements. And they killed and captured many French colonists, including the arrogant French governor, whom they clubbed to death. The French and their Indian allies, the Choctaw, struck back and within a year had driven the Natchez from their territory. And about 400 of the Natchez that were captured were sold into slavery. But many of them fled to other tribes, such as the Chickasaw. And because of their ancient religion, they were seen as great mystics. Next, we're going to talk about the war between the French and the Chickasaw Indians. The Chickasaw were an Indian nation that lived in modern terms in what today would be western Tennessee and northern Mississippi, right alongside the Mississippi River. One of the things that caused conflict between the French and the Chickasaw was that the Chickasaw Indians had given safe refuge to Natchez refugees. We just talked about the Natchez. They were fleeing the French after their war with them, and the French wanted them returned, and the the Chickasaw wouldn't do it. The other thing was that the French were kind of high-handed in demanding that the Chickasaw not trade with the English and that they expel English traders that came among them, and that kind of angered the Chickasaw too. Chickasaw also sometimes interfered with French communications down the Mississippi River between Illinois and Louisiana. So all these things together are kind of cumulatively the cause of the war between them. To help fight the Chickasaw, who were pretty tough, the French engaged the services of the Choctaw Indians, who were one of the bigger tribes in the region. You can see their name there on the map. And also the usual Illinois Indians, which were allied with the French at this time. During the 1730s, the French and their Indian allies conducted several several major large campaigns and expeditions against the Chickasaw. Some of these had over a thousand men in them. It's always amazed me that the French, so far from the ocean and so far inland in a hostile, raw wilderness, were able to do some of these military undertakings. And despite their immense efforts, the French had difficulty coordinating these campaigns and a lot of bad luck, too. In one of the campaigns, they had heavy artillery that would have been effective had they been able to get it to where they wanted to go. But trying to drag heavy artillery through raw wilderness, as we've seen in previous podcasts, is really difficult. The French spent enormous sums on this war, both in giving gifts to the Choctaw and the Illinois, as well as just the fighting itself and keeping armies in the field. And as we've seen with other armies with the English, most of the time the French forces consisted mostly of allied Indian troops or warriors. The Chickasaw did a pretty good job defending themselves and sometimes defeating the French, but the war did eventually wear them down just through attrition, as well as the many raids by allied Choctaw warriors just raiding uh, Chickasaw villages. And in 1740, the Chickasaw eventually agreed to give up the Natchez refugees that the French wanted back. But it's important to mention that the French really never defeated the Chickasaw. And in fact, the fighting went on clear into the 1760s when the French finally lost control of the area to the British. So they never really concluded the war. And it was the Choctaw who did much of the fighting for the French. The French offered them things, including uh, scalp bounties for Chickasaw scalps, which was kind of a common thing that happened in these wars. But it was never conclusively won by the French. The last of the frontier wars that I want to talk about is the war between the Fox Indians and the French. The Fox, who were also known as the Musquaki or Musquaki Indians, occupied what is today central Wisconsin into Green Bay, which they, which the fox called the Stinking Bay because of the smell of dead fish. The fox were an aggressive tribe that were often at war or skirmishing with neighboring Indian nations, including the Chippewa, the Illinois, the Ottawa, the Huron, and the Sioux. So when the French went to war with them, they didn't have a hard time finding Indian allies. The war between the French and the Fox Indians was over control of the rivers and portages in the modern state of Wisconsin that connected the Great Lakes with the Mississippi River. This was critical. Control of the area would give the French control of a wilderness highway from Canada to the Gulf of Mexico through the interior of North America. That's what the war was really about. As with all these wars, the war or the fighting was sporadic in nature. It was hard to get armies that far back into the interior, and so it took time for the French to assemble troops to get their Indian allies organized, etc. So it wasn't like there was just one battle or one war, and of course that characterizes pretty much all these frontier wars. They were very sporadic in nature. And even when the French weren't directly fighting with the Fox, neighboring Indian tribes that were allied with the French and usually didn't like the Fox were skirmishing with them in between. 
The French were very aggressive about this war, and the Fox generally uh, were on the losing end of it just by attrition. And it became so bad for them, they eventually migrated across the Mississippi River westward into what is today the modern state of Iowa. But the French policy was so ruthless that they even sent armies into what is today Iowa to try and deal with the Fox. And at some point, it's thought that the Fox population dwindled to only a few hundred people. Many of the Fox Indians fled to the Iroquois and joined them. And many of the fox were sold into slavery. Probably the only thing that saved the fox was the fact that the French were distracted with other wars and other important matters. And it was so far away. Iowa is a long way away from Canada. The French spent enormous sums and enormous manpower on these wars with the Indians in the interior of North America. I don't think at the time they realized that all this fighting and all that they were doing would be for naught. The big beneficiaries of the French work were the Americans, future Americans, a country that didn't exist yet. As Americans moved westward, there were there were much fewer Indians to resist them, and a lot of these Indian nations that had once been powerful were now weakened or almost gone. For further reading on this subject, I recommend the following books and articles. The Tuscarora War, Indians, Settlers, and the Fight for the Carolina Colonies by David Laver. The Yamasee War, a study of culture, economy, and conflict in the colonial South by William L. Ramsey. The Indian Slave Trade, The Rise of the English Empire in the American South, 1670 to 1717, by Alan Gallay. Colonial South Carolina, A History, by Robert M. Weir. The Colonial Wars, 1689 to 1762, by Howard H. Peckham. Masters of Empire, Great Lakes Indians, and the Making of America, by Michael A. McDonnell. Atlas of the North American Indian, by Carl Waldman. The Struggle for a Continent, The Wars of Early America by John Furling. The La Salle Expedition on the Mississippi River, a lost manuscript of Nicholas de La Salle, 1682, edited by William C. Foster and translated by Johanna S. Warren. Our Savage Neighbors, How Indian War Transformed Early America by Peter Silver. French and Indians in the Heart of North America, 1630 to 1815, edited by Robert Engelbert and Guillaume Teasdale. Celeron de Blainville and French Expansion into the Ohio Valley by George A. Wood, published in the Mississippi Valley Historical Review, Volume 9, Number 4, March 1923. Forest Diplomats, The Role of Interpreters in Indian-White Relations on the Early American Frontier by Yasuhida Kawashima, published in the American Indian Quarterly, Volume 13, Number 1, Winter 1989. Fort Toulouse of the Alabamas and the 18th Century Indian Trade by Donald P. Heldman, published in World Archaeology, Volume 5, Number 2, October 1973.